Hi. Uh, in the last lecture, we went through probabilistic analysis of an algorithm to get the average case complexity. And I mentioned that it is not an easy thing because you have to assume the distribution of the input data. And sometimes you just don't know this. We assume that the distribution is uniform in the last lecture. So every event has an equal chance of happening. And that's pretty much already the simplest we can make it. Now, in reality, this is not going to happen all the time. And even if you are a genius when it comes to statistics and um, probability distributions, so you know what the distribution is, your math whiz, you can work out the average case, you're still at the mercy of your data. Uh, and what do I mean by this? Well, all right, think about the fine max algorithm that we had before. It's big O log N on average, right? We, we derive that. And that is assuming the input is uniformly distributed. So great. You don't need to know a lot of math to get that. But what if that is not the average input that you get? What if your input is not uniformly distributed? What if all the input, like every single time you get an array, it is always in ascending order? So it forces you to get the worst case. Well, well, that's not going to happen really because um, there's only one ascending order, as you can see. And even if that is the case, then that actually makes the problem very easy because, well, if you're looking for the last, uh, sorry, if you're looking for the largest element, then you just get the last one. So the problem is what happens when uh, the input is not always in ascending order, but most of the time it is in ascending order? Uh, what can you do? Well, here's the thing. Um, when you're solving a problem and you get some input, nothing says that you cannot modify the input. Well, um, don't, don't modify the input to be something else. But what I'm, what I'm meaning here is that you can sort the input. And what we're going to be doing here, actually not sorting the input, we're actually going to randomize the input. So what do, we, what do I mean by that? Um, so if your input is always, always in ascending order, or maybe not ascending order completely, but like it's mostly ascending in order, like mostly in ascending order. So you have to, um, so, so you have to like, uh, you will get close to the worst case uh, complexity in terms of the number of assignments. Well, what you can do is you can randomize that input so that you lose that property. You, you lose the fact that it's mostly ascending. Now, you, you can also sort it, but sorting will take n log n, so um, that's stupid. You don't know, you're not going to be doing that. But randomizing, maybe it will cost less. So the idea here is that you got some sort of input, you know it's mostly bad because it's like mostly ascending, so you have to do a lot of assignments. So what you do is you get the input, you randomize it. Um, because what happened is if you randomize the data and you're only looking for the maximum, it doesn't really matter now, does it? Because you're only looking for the maximum element. You, 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 still, you may have to do fewer number of assignments, but you will still get the answer. You will still, you will still be able to find the, um, the data. Now, the bad news is that when we randomize, it's normally a uh, big O of N. So there's something that's very simple called fisher Yates shuffle to generate a random permutation on a final sequence. Uh, you can look this up on um, Wikipedia. But really, um, what they say is just put all the numbers in the head, draw them out one by one. Yeah, that is actually an algorithm. It's called Fisher Yates Shuffle. Uh, in real life, if well, if you're using Java, there's a random class which you probably have seen from COM1 to 5 or COM2 to 5. And there's also something called the secure random class, which you probably have seen if you did cryptography or security. Like that, that is the one that will give you a Crypto, uh, cryptography secure random number. 
right? So, and yeah, anyway, this is ON. So if you just want to um, apply that to the find max algorithm, there's no point because, well, we want to make it uh, bigger of log N. Like the worst case is ON anyway, so what's the point? But if you got a problem where the worst time complexity is worse than ON, then maybe it's worthwhile to randomize your input so that um, you don't get stuck with these bad inputs. Um, but basically, you'll introduce randomness to your algorithm. Now, before we go on, I want to be perfectly clear with what we're doing. In the previous lecture, we did something called probabilistic analysis. And what happened is we have a deterministic algorithm, as in uh, there's no randomness about this algorithm, right? Uh, if you give it the same input, it will also give you the same output with the exact number of steps. Now, we're using probabilistic analysis to work out the average case running time by looking at an average input. So we try to work out what kind of input you're going to get. You fit it into this deterministic algorithm. You get something out. That's the average case running time. What we're doing now is we're going to use something called the randomized algorithm. And the randomness is part of the algorithm. All right, so if you get the same input, you may actually get a different output. Well, not a different output, but you see, think that think about the algorithm that we're doing. We're doing find max. So the original find max algorithm, if you just like run it with the same input, you will get the same number of assignments every time. Now, what we're gonna do here is let's say when I start the find max algorithm, the first thing that I do is I randomize the array. So every time I run it, will I get the same number of assignment? No, I'll get the diff different number of assignment. So you can't derive the average case running time. We d there's no such thing as the average case running time. What we get is the expected running time. And we can do this without knowing what kind of input we're going to get. Why? Because we're going to randomize the input anyway. So make sure you understand the difference of what we're doing now and what we're doing before. One more time. This time, we are adding randomness into the algorithm. We make it part of the algorithm. Whereas before, we're using probability theory. And why are we doing this? Like, what's the difference? Well, with probabilistic analysis, if there's only one input, and you don't know the uh, average case running time because how do you know? You, you don't know what kind of data you're getting. You can assume, but it can be um, it can be wrong. Your assumption can be wrong. Uh, think about the example I said earlier. Like you can your your data can be bad all the time. As in, the input will always force you to go close to the um, the worst case complexity, and there's nothing you can do about it because well. <laughs> um, you just have to live with the bad data. With the randomized algorithm, whatever input you get, you randomize. You randomize it. You change it. Um, so you know the distribution of your data. You you can make your input uniformly distributed by randomizing it. So you're not going to get stuck with a whole bunch of bad inputs, so to speak. Right. And. This can be a bad thing to do sometimes. I don't want to go through it. Um, there are some cases where um, if you're given something random and you try to randomize it further, you actually remove the randomness. Um, yeah, I can't think of any good example. Um, but generally, um, don't mess up. I'm sorry. Don't mess with probability unless you know what you're doing because it can um, things can go really bad sometimes. But anyway, um, here's the TLDR version. Deterministic algorithm, here's one input. What's the average running time? No idea. But with probability algorithm, here's one input. What's the average running time? Well, that's better. Well, you give me an input, I'm just going to randomize it anyway, so I know the distribution. Okay, so that's the difference. And why do you want to use randomized algorithms? Well, the first example, um, the first point that I made earlier is just that you want to avoid bad inputs. You you want to avoid inputs that causes your algorithm to run close to the worst case um, complexity, right? With these assignments, like um, with these assignment operation in find max. 
Another reason also because if you try to do something deterministically, it may take too long. And we'll talk about this later when we talk about uh, probabilistic algorithms. Um, the difference between probabilistic algorithms and randomized algorithms, uh, well, I'll talk about this in a bit, but um, yeah, it's not that big of a difference. It's, uh, to me, they're really the same thing. Um, also, you might want to have randomness in your algorithms because you're doing crypto or you're doing security, like um, like password generators or there's something called a nonce. If you've done cryptography, you probably uh, remember that. Uh, but don't worry about this. Like, I'm not really going to talk about the last point there. Is there any reason for not using randomized algorithms? Well, it says here that I want to avoid bad inputs. That's the reason, but... Um, just be aware that sometimes the distribution of the input is part of the data. Uh, you can't just say, oh, if this is input, my program will take too long, so I'm just going to randomize it. Now, the question is, when you randomize the input, is that going to change the problem or not? Because, well, if that's the case, then that's definitely not something you should be doing. All right. Anyway, but we're going to focus on um, the first two really like uh, as being the reason why you want to do uh, randomized algorithms and the example I'm going to use here is quicksort now this is something that you have done in com 5 com um, I forgot the name now com, 20, com 2010 and if you need more reference well you can look at your um, lecture notes from previous year or you can well this is easy to find on Wikipedia or geeks with geeks anyway and the idea of quicksort is basically you're not actually calling quicksort you're calling this uh, partition functions again and again and again so you pick a pivot um, element and in the version that you studied uh, i'm guessing the pivot element is always the first element so you pick a pivot element um, then you arrange everything to be on the left side or the right side of the pivot element so um Everything smaller than three is going to be on the first half of the array, and everything bigger than three is going to be the second half of the array, and then I move three to the middle there. So after I call partition once, I fix three, and I know that three is in the right place. So every time you call partition, you fix one element inside the array. And the average uh, running time of quicksort is n log n. Um, we're not going to derive that. Um, that's pretty hard. You can look for it on CLRS if you want to. But on average, you expect that the array to be partitioned into two parts and they're about the equal length. So if you remember how to do the um, recursion tree method, it's just exactly the same like most sort, right? You have n and then f n over two on the second level, n over four in the next level. So this is gonna be n plus n plus n and how many levels uh, log n levels so big O and log n and this is the uh, recursive um, formula here okay so that's the average case of quicksort in the worst case if the array is already sorted or is sorted in um, in descending order um, whenever you pick the pivot everything else is going to be on the right hand side of it so Instead of going um, from n to n over 2 to n over 4 and so on, you're going to end up with um, this recursive relationship. Tn is t uh, n minus 1 plus n, which you should know is actually n squared, right? This is the, um, the sum that you have, um, you know, the common summation formula 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus other the plus n. Now, in reality, this is going to be very rare. Uh, we can discuss this in the workshop. Um, this was actually the exam question from um, last year. But the chance of the hap this happening is very, very rare. Uh, but just the same with the Feynman problem, um, you can have cases, well, you don't necessarily, it's not necessarily the worst case, but you may have to do a lot of partitions than normal because your data is kind of, it's mostly sorted, mostly in ascending order. So what we're doing here, we can introduce randomness into quicksort by first randomizing the input. So every time you get an input, you randomize it. 
Um, so what's what's the case? Uh, well, what's the worst case complexity of doing this? Well, worst case complexity of quicksort is n squared. If you get a bad input, you may have to do n squared operations. But the average case is n log n. If you randomize the input, it's going to cost you n. And from there, to sort it, it's going to take you n log n. So yes, it is worth it to do so. And this is an example of application of randomized algorithms. Now, is this the way that you do it? Actually, no, because that's a better way to do it. Uh, you don't need to randomize the whole array. You just pick a random element in the array as a pivot. Now, on every, even if the array is sorted, you should kind of pick something in the middle of the array. So then what we're doing here, we avoid a bad input, which can happen if you only look at the first element as a pivot. Or if you always pick the first element as a pivot, you can um, have a bad input. But if you pick a random element in the array as the pivot, even if the array is sorted, you're not going to end up with the worst case. And well, I I can't think of any input example where this method doesn't work. I said if you pick a random element in a somewhere in the array, then it's just the same as randomizing the uh, randomizing the whole array, right? Because what matters here is how you um, break down the array into um, the sub problems. Like um, if you can go. If you can break it down into two sub arrays of equal length or roughly equal length, then you're good. You're good to go. And you can do this just by choosing a random element inside the array as a pivot. And this is pretty much our one. You just generate a random number and then that's it. So this is something we can discuss more during the workshop. So let's do that then. Um, and that's pretty much it for randomized algorithms. And what I mean here is that you have an algorithm, you have a deterministic algorithm, and you inject some sort of randomness to it. Now, I do want to talk about one more thing. I want to talk about the, um, the idea of probabilistic algorithms. And this is something that you've probably heard before. Uh, if you have done crypto or security, um, when they talk about prime numbers, factorization, um, what else is there, discrete log, all that, you probably have seen a form of probabilistic algorithms. So what's the difference? Uh, when I look at randomized algorithms, I think about a deterministic algorithm, you know, like quicksort, linear search, um, find max, and we randomize the input. Well, maybe not always randomizing the input, but we add some sort of random, we add some sort of randomness to it. Whereas with probabilistic algorithms, the randomness is part of the algorithm. And we said before why we want to do this. Well, because if you try to do things like factorization or primality testing using um deterministic approach, it may take too long. So in the end, um, what they did was, well, let's use this method. It's random. Uh, it may not work all the time, but it's fast. It's, it's very fast compared to the um, deterministic one. So it's a trade-off between uh, correctness and complexity. Now, in the end, are they both randomized? Yeah. Are they both probabilistic? Yeah. And I don't want to get, um, I don't want to talk about the uh, definitions. Like, you will hear people say randomized algorithms. You will hear people say probabilistic algorithm. Just make sure you understand. Um, they're like, they're like two different versions, if you like. But in the end, they're both randomized algorithms, and they're both probabilistic algorithms. Uh, some people may not be happy with that definitions, um, but again, this unit is, is not about definitions, so I'm going to leave it at that. Um, so here's one example of a probabilistic algorithm. This is matrix multiplication verification. So we're not doing matrix multiplication. Uh, the idea is I give you two matrices and well, actually three matrices. I'll give you A, B, and C, and you, you gotta verify if A times B is actually C. How would you do that? Now, you would think that, oh, I'll just multiply A and B, and if I get C, I'm done. But that will cost you N cubed, where N is the um, dimension of the matrix. 
right? Well, you know how to do matrix multiplication, hopefully. So that will cost you n cubed, maybe faster if you do something like um, Strassen's algorithm. There's, there are better ways to do matrix multiplication, but it's still, still pretty close to n cubed. Now, there is a probabilistic approach to um, do this. And the idea is, I'm going to pick a random factor x. So in this case here, I'm doing like 1, 1, 1. Then I'm going to multiply both um, a, b with that factor, and also c with that factor. If a, b is equal to c, then definitely I'm going to get the same result. Can I do this in a n squared? Yes, I can. If, right, if I have one matrix and I'll only multiply by a factor, that's not n cube anymore. Especially if you choose your factor carefully. So here you um, you only have to do 86 plus 46 plus 36, and 88 plus 44 plus 36 and so on, because this is one, one, one. Even if it's like two, 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 or three, 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 or four, 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 you can see how you can perform this much faster, right? I mean, okay, if you if you do this naively, yeah, it may still cost O n cube, but like I said, pick a factor, pick the factor properly, uh, make sure it's one that you can do some savings, and this multiplication, you can do it in O n squared, or a bit more than N squared. Now, can you do this one in O n squared? Well, here you have to multiply two matrices, like this is three by three and three by three, so surely this is N cube, right? Well, no, because what you do is you multiply the right um, matrix by 1, 1, 1. So you get uh, the different factor here, and then you multiply that by with the first one. So it is not n cube. That's the most important point. You can do it faster than n cube. And again, uh, you do it for both. And if you get the same factor here, then you know, well, actually no. You can still be wrong. If a, b is not equal to c, and you choose a random factor x, then yeah, like a, if you do a, b, x, uh, and then you do c, x, if they're somehow different, um, there's a, ch uh, well, you know, you know that uh, a, b is not equal to c, for sure. But, if they are different, then the probability that you get ABS equal to CX is very small. But even if the probability is not small, we can use something called probability amplification. So what's that mean? Okay. You do um, ABX times CX. So let's, let's assume that AB is not equal to C. And let's say you're like, you have like 50% chance that um, if a, b is not equal to c, if you pick a x, you will get a, b, x equal to c, x. So it's, it's, it's a false positive or false negative, like whichever way, whichever one's positive, whichever one's negative, doesn't matter. So what you do is, um, all right, I try, I try a factor x and it, well, it tells me that a, b, x is equal to c, x. So I know that there's only 50% chance that a, b is equal to c. Well, actually, this time we know that a, b is not equal to c. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick another factor. I'm going to pick x1, say. Well, I should say, sorry, this is a type of that should be x prime. I'm going to pick x prime. Then I'll do a, b, x prime. And I'll also do c, x prime. If they're somehow equal again, then the chance of me being wrong is a half times a half, which is point, uh, which is 0.25. And you keep on doing this. So every time you do this, um, you have the chance of being wrong. So you do this 10 times, right? You do this 10 times, you pick 10 different factors. You pick 10 different factors, you keep on multiplying a, b, x, and c, x. The chance of you being wrong is 0 0.000976. This is le less than uh, zero, this is like 0 0.01% 0 .01, 0 .01 chance of being wrong. And this is actually the approach that people take with a probabilistic algorithm, like this thing called probability amplification. Um, so again, you try different 
values for x, you try different vectors. If at any point you get that uh, a, b, x is not equal to c, x, and you're never sure that a, b is not equal to c. But if you do this like 10 times, 20 times, and you, see, you keep on getting that a, b, x equal to c, x, then, well, there's a very, very good chance that a, b is equal to c. Okay. And the cost of doing this is still n squared, assuming you, the number of trials is not so big. I mean, well, okay, we have three by three matrix. So if you do this more than three times, then yeah, it's not worth doing. But if your matrix is like 100 by 100 and you do it 10 times, then, you know, that's, that's less than n cubed, right? So that is probabilistic algorithms. Um, at least this is the version of probabilistic algorithms that I learned when I first um, heard about it. Right, so the idea is it's an algorithm which may not give you the right answer, but has a good chance of giving you the right answer. So the idea is, well, keep on applying it, keep on doing it until the probability of it giving you the right answer is high enough. And then you say, well, I'm 99% sure that this is correct. It's never 100%. Unfortunately, you'll never get 100%. But the amount of time I need to get to 99% is minuscule compared to the amount of time I need to get 100%. So worth doing. And this is a common technique in cryptography. Uh, as I mentioned before, with primality testing and with factorization, discrete log, all that. The probability of being wrong is so small, and we do several trials, which means that the probability of being wrong is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So one that you may have seen before is what we call the FEMAS primary testing. If you never heard about it, don't worry. Um, I'm showing you this here, but I'm not going to examine you on it. Like, what I need out of you is the idea. Like, you know what, so, um, just make sure that you know what probabilistic algorithm is. The, the whole idea of like um, probability amplification. I think that's important. Now, if I have a prime number, P, then if I take any value, A, mod P, to the power of P minus 1, then it's going to be 1 modular P. I can prove this. Um, there, there's an easy proof for it. Now, with, so with this formula here, so if you give a number and you want to know if the number is prime or not, I can just simply plug it in. And if I get a one, so let's say you give me a, uh, you give me like um, two ninety seven. I don't actually know if two ninety seven is prime or not, but you give me two ninety seven, right? Then then I pick a random a. Let's say I pick two. Then I do two to the power of two ninety seven minus one. Then I do modulo two ninety seven. If I get one, then there's a chance that two ninety seven is prime. Now. Is it guaranteed to be prime? Actually, no, it's not prime, isn't it? It's divisible by three. Oh, stupid me. Anyway, um, it's not prime. Um, but if I do get a one, that's a chance that it actually is prime. Is it 100%? No. So how do I know? Well, let's instead of using a equal to two, I'm going to try a equal to three. Then try it again. Let's do three to the power of 296 and see if you get one or not. And I keep on trying different values of A. Now, this doesn't always work because there are things called Carmichael numbers, which will mess this up. You, know, you can read it on your own if you're interested. But it's a, it has a good chance of working. And the thing is... Oh, sorry, I should not have... Um, where is it? Oh, sorry, I have it here. Uh, the thing is... If you want to know the answer for sure, you have to do trial division many, many, many times. And well, there are better ways. Um, there are things called the um, number field C, uh, which is basically it's still a trial division. And what I mean by trial division is you simply try every number that's less than 297 to see if it's, to try to divide it and see if, it, if you can, then you know that 297 is not prime. See, the thing is that approach um, is very expensive is exponential in complexity. Whereas here, all I have to do is do one exponentiation, and you can actually show that this is linear in complexity. 
um, and you have to do it many times but that's just a constant times linear so it's still linear and then again you will get the answer it may not be correct but it has a very good chance of being correct unless you get these things called Carmichael numbers so anyway that is the idea of probabilistic algorithm make sure you understand make sure you understand the difference between randomized algorithms and probabilistic algorithm with probabilistic algorithm random randomness is part of the algorithm All right we want to do the, we, want, we want to exploit uh, probability amplification All right we, we want to exploit the fact that we can almost get this right we, we have a good chance of getting the right answer and if I do it again and again and again then there's a very very good chance that I'm correct that's what we're doing. Um, it may not work all the time, and there are traps, like I said, like Carmichael numbers. But this is what we do uh, in real life. In in some cases, when 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 time is of the essence, when it's more important to be fast than is uh, than it is to be correct. And besides, you have like ninety nine point nine 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 percent chance to be correct anyway. So yeah, uh, that is um, probabilistic algorithm. Just one more thing about um, probabilistic algorithms, and I guess this is something I can ask in exam. I asked about this last year. Uh, something you should know. Um, so when I discuss about probabilistic algorithm, it's like you got two options. One option is that um, you use something deterministic. It'll take very long time, but it will give you the right answer. Or you use something which is probabilistic. It'll be very fast, but you may get the wrong answer. Now, actually, probabilistic algorithms, you can see it from a different way. It's, it's not that you're probably going to get the right answer. It's more that you probably will never finish. Uh, so like another dimension to think about probabilities, uh, about probabilistic algorithms. So there are two sort of probabilistic algorithm. One is called Las Vegas and the other one is called Monte Carlo. There's one more called uh, Atlantic City, I think. Yeah. So these are all names of casinos. So a Las Vegas algorithm is an algorithm that always gives you the correct answer if it finishes, but it may not finish. So hopefully you can see why this is still uh, probabilistic. Uh, because if something is de deterministic, it will finish. For sure, it just may not, may not take a very long time. So Las Vegas, uh, yeah, I guess it's a slippery slope, isn't it? Because, hmm, yeah, I, if if a certain algorithm which is not guaranteed to finish, it's maybe something inside there that stops it from finishing. But if it does finish, it gives you the correct answer. Then it is. Uh, this is what we call the Las Vegas one. So I guess another way to think about this is that um, in Las Vegas, when it finishes, it will give you the right answer. How is that different to deterministic? Well, that's the chance that it won't finish. And it's kind of subtle. Um, sorry, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's important to go into that um, any further. But Monte Carlo, it will always give you an answer. It will always finish in time, but the answer that it gives you may be incorrect. So this is the the one that you, we've seen before, like the um, the matrix modification, verification, uh, format testing. Actually, majority of algorithms that you see is going to be Monte Carlo, because they will finish. They will that they quick. They finish, but it may not give you the right answer. And this is an example of Las Vegas versus Monte Carlo. As you can see here, this is random. I guess that's the difference. That, I guess that's the major difference between the deterministic and uh, randomized algorithms within Las, within Las Vegas algorithm and deterministic one. Because with Las Vegas, you still have random element inside it. Here, this is a linear search. Well, not linear search anymore. This is a search algorithm. So I give you an array, um, try to look for it inside the array. And as you can see, with the Las Vegas algorithm, I just generate a random number and I, tr I try the random element inside the array. I'll keep on doing this. Now, 
if x is sorry if the size of the array is very very big and you're very very unlucky this may never finish this may take a very long time to finish but when it does finish you know that you got the right answer now Monte Carlo is different it will this will finish in time but it's, it's kind of stupid right because uh, you just go count plus plus you just do it like max times like you can't say oh max is equal to 1000 do it a thousand times and if you found it great just just stop if you if you found it before a thousand that's great you got the right answer but sometimes you hit a thousand and you say well, all right whatever just give me the last random thing that you get so this will finish after some time you set it using max but when it finishes it may not give you the right answer so Las Vegas and Monte Carlo, make sure you understand different, uh, the difference. Uh, the way I memorize this is, well, Las Vegas is in America and Monte Carlo is in Europe. I just think that you, if you're in America and you try to cheat in the casino, um, they'll be a lot less friendlier than if you are in Europe. That's just my guess. I don't know. Maybe I'm being, I'm stereotyping Americans here. Um, so if you're in Las Vegas, you better give the right answer or don't say anything at all. If you're in Monte Carlo, you can try to um, uh, swindle your way out of it. Anyway, that's how that's how I remember it. I'm sorry if you're American and you don't like what I said. So Las Vegas and Monte Carlo. Um, examples, um, Burger Sword, also known as Permutation Sword, Slow, sh slow sort, something something sort, shotgun sort. I mean, this is where you wait. This is where you have an array. You randomize the array, and you hope that it is sorted. It's definitely a randomized algorithm, right? It's definitely there's definitely a probabilistic algorithm because there's some randomness element into it. Is it Las Vegas or is it Monte Carlo? Well, that depends on how you implement the algorithm. If you let it run forever, until it returns the correct answer, like what you have here, then that's Las Vegas. If you randomize like a next amount of time and then you finish, then it's a Monte Carlo algorithm. It's a very, very bad algorithm. Well, we know Burgers what is very, very bad anyway. But yeah, just showing you the difference between Monte Carlo and Las Vegas. You can actually easily go from Las Vegas to Monte Carlo or vice versa. Um, by putting a time limit or removing the time limit So basically Las Vegas you just say look do this um, Keep on doing it until you have done it like hundred times and then stop. Well, that means it's a Monte Carlo now Because it may not give you the right answer And same thing with Monte Carlo uh, you can you can add, like add a check at the end of the algorithm to make sure you get get the right answer if you don't have the right answer repeat it so or remove the uh, remove the uh, time limit. So really, I mean, they both kind of the same because you only have to modify a, a tiny bit to, to go from one to the other one. Well, in most cases, this is the, this is what happens. There are some special cases, I'm sure, but generally, it is very easy to go from Monte Carlo to Las Vegas. And um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. We can you can think about all the stuff that we did before and think whether it's um Monte Carlo or Las Vegas. If you do the randomized quick sort, is that Monte Carlo or Las Vegas? And most of the time you can just think about the end result. If you do randomized quick sort, are you gonna get the right answer? Yes, you're definitely gonna get the right answer. So it is Las Vegas. Matrix multiplication. Are you gonna write, are you gonna get the right answer? Maybe not. So it's Monte Carlo. Same with prim primality testing. So generally, that is how I see if something is Monte Carlo or Las Vegas, just by the fact that will I get the right answer? When you finish, will I get the right answer? If the answer is yes, then that's the Las Vegas one. And like I said, you will found you will find that most of the probability algorithm is Monte Carlo, because that's the more useful one. Right. The number one reason why people use probabilistic algorithm is to speed up the running time. So they 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 can tolerate um, the algorithm giving you the wrong answer 
if it means um, they can run it a million times faster. And we can, uh, a million times, it's actually being um, very generous here. We talk about a billion, billion, billion times faster when we talk about these algorithms. Okay, so I think that is it on this topic of probability. Um, see, the way I see this topic, I think this is the hardest topic of the whole unit. But the good news is um, we're not going to that we're not going too deep into it. And even all the stuff here, I don't know how much I'm going to ask you about uh, this topic in the exam. Because I think it's hard. Um, the way I see it is, it's like um, um, dynamic programming back in COM 5 COM 2010. If you ask me what is the hardest topic in COM 5 then I would say it's dynamic programming. Everything else is easy compared to dynamic programming. But did you do a lot of hard dynamic programming questions? No. We did not do much of dynamic programming in uh, COM 5 COM 2010. So that's why it is the hardest topic. Like, as a topic, it is the hardest one. But uh, in what you have to do for the unit, it's not that hard. So same thing with probability. Um, I think as a topic, it is the hardest one. But we're not doing that much on, uh, on it. And also, it's not that hard if you actually know a probability. In fact, if you're okay with probability, the whole thing here might be very easy for you anyway. So um, don't stress too much about this topic. Like, uh, Make sure you understand the main takeaways that are listed here. So you know how to use probabilistic analysis. Just a simple one. Like... Um, uh, um, make sure you understand the difference between doing the probabilistic analysis and what a randomized algorithm is. Like I said, like probabilistic analysis, you do that on deterministic algorithm. And probabilistic algorithm, you have randomness inside it, so that's the difference. You make, make sure you understand why you want to use a randomized algorithm, like the reason I explained before. And finally, the Monte Carlo and Las Vegas, make sure you know uh, the difference between them which I don't think is hard at all. Okay, so I think that's it for this week. Um, yeah, and I'll see you in the next topic.